This has been a wonderful year for Holy Communion and for me serving as your senior warden. I have loved seeing all that each of you do to make this church what it is. One of last Sunday's hymns described Holy Communion and what I hope it will always be. This is the Lord's home, house, home of all his people, school for the faithful, refuge for the sinner, rest for the pilgrim, haven for the weary, all find a welcome. Thank you so much. Um, it's now time to call upon the treasurer for a financial report. Mr. Treasurer. Thank you. Unfortunately, I won't be as brief as Emily's uh, statements, um, or as exciting, probably. Um, I'll point you to the financials. Uh, what they do is provide you uh, several different ways of looking at the budget, as well as what we actually experienced in 2016, and then there are also some comparisons between 2017 to previous year. Uh, pledges are up slightly. Uh, they're at the highest level in history, so thank you for that. Uh, that being said, the budget is tight. Uh, there, despite the increased gifts, uh, there is no fluff in the budget. Uh, we've gone through it, and we're now in a position where we're fully staffed, uh, both from a clergy as well as a staff people perspective. Uh, and so there's, uh, there's some strain there, uh, but we're in a good but serious place. Um, in order to balance the budget, in 2017, we had to draw on a salary reserve that was set aside three years ago during the time when we were understaffed, and we were able to um, get some additional reserves at that time. Uh, some of the reason for the tightening uh, or for the higher expenses are related to health care costs, which continue to rise. Uh, we have a committee as well as vestry members that are looking at health care costs uh, and trying to find a way to contain these costs, and they'll continue their efforts during the year. Um, in addition, uh, some of it's related to the fact that we're now fully staffed. Uh, as I mentioned, um, uh, we were in a very different place uh, three years ago when these reserves were set aside, um, and it's a great place to be, uh, but I encourage you all to dig deep so that we can continue to provide uh, the opportunities that we provide you um, and that we as a parish can continue to support uh, the great competent quality um, staff members and uh, clergy members that we have. I also encourage you to fulfill your pledge. Uh, there were 52 families that didn't fulfill their pledge which left us about $38,000 short last year. Um, if you ever have any interest in knowing kind of where you stand from a pledge perspective, uh, or just want to want a reminder feel free to reach out we're happy to help uh, happy to help you um, move along and um, and dig deep again for this parish uh, we also had others that gave more than their pledge and I thank you for that um, again uh, this this is one of those things that we all need to come together and especially at times like this and ensure that we can continue our ministry uh, finally, I encourage you all to sign up for monthly auto pay uh, or quarterly pay or um, some regular pay. Uh, it makes it a lot easier for us to budget and for, to manage our cash flows if we're on a more regular um, payment stream. It also uh, prevents uh, forgetting or um, other things that may occur during the year, um, and then you come down to the end of the year and something comes up. Uh, just spread it out, make it a little bit easier. Um, we're happy to help you uh, get, get that all set up. Uh, one other item that's worth noting within the budget is the significant difference in expenses this year in comparison to uh, last year, and that's on the maintenance line. Uh, if you look at the maintenance line, the actual compared to budget uh, is significantly different. It's about $50,000 out of round. Uh, you're all very aware of the large number of maintenance projects that we did, and um, thanks to Tom for his efforts in working through all of these, uh, whether it's the HVAC repairs or the small painting or carpeting jobs and things that were ongoing throughout the year. Uh, that was an extremely elevated number. Um, and we did have reserves set aside to take care of those, um, but um, it was a particularly tough area uh, this year. Um, finally, regarding the balance sheet as a whole, as you can see, 
Um, we continue to have a strong balance sheet. Uh, we've got great liquid reserves and we have no debt. Uh, so thank you all for that. And uh, let's continue to support our church and dig deep uh, as we move into this next phase of our church. Take questions. Yeah. Any, and take questions. Anybody have any questions on, yep, sure. With pledges being up, uh, why does it show a decrease in total offering? Uh, there's, a, there's a couple of different reasons why that is. So if you look at the budget, 2016 budget to 2017 budget, it's only, it is up slightly. So it's up by a few thousand dollars. Um, we budget based on pledges. We don't base, budget based on what was actually received. And so despite the fact that we did receive more in total pledges, um, last year, uh, we can't budget for that. We have to budget on what people have actually pledged. Um, in addition, um, we had some other items that also are considered revenue that fell off this, this coming year. Uh, part of that was diocesan income that we received um, in support of Hester. Uh, and with those falling off and then some other changes that were happening within different line items in terms of whether something was an unrestricted gift or an undesignated gift versus a pledge, uh, there was just some movement that that occurred in that area. Correct, and there, the the question was: there's a decrease in the diocesan and social ministries area, and, the, and it was stated that that's a tough place to have a cut. Uh, what I will tell you is that the cut did not occur within the social ministries area or outreach. Our outreach efforts are will. Um, are remaining constant, and we will support those institutions that we've supported in the past at the same level that we did this last year. Uh, what that decrease is associated with is um, a decrease to our diocesan commitment um, and not fulfilling the full 10% diocesan commitment and instead keeping that number constant at the level that we were at previous year. So that number is based off of a lot of different um, inputs um, and it was formulated from two years previous when we were at a high point um, from a revenue standpoint, um, in which case uh, we felt that it would be a good way. And again, I'd mentioned there was no fluff in this budget. We, we found every possible way that we could keep our expenses down to get this budget in line. But social outreach was not affected in any way. Terrific. Thank you all very much. If I could uh, supplement the treasurer's response to Barbara's question with regard to the diocesan commitment, um, I went down and spoke with the bishop about this. Uh, we did not cut back from the 2016 level. We simply did not make the increase uh, that was based on um, the calculations. Uh, he is uh, understanding of that, supportive of that, and encouraging of what we're doing with regard to the capital campaign as well. Uh, and the vestry has uh, established that its top priority, if there's surplus unexpected revenue, is to restore that to the full asking. So we are, uh, we're in conversation with the bishop about that. It's now my pleasure to give the annual State of the Parish Address, um, and I know that everybody is looking forward to a capital campaign update, and I promise you that we will have one. But lest we get distracted from what is and has been our ministry this year, let's take a little walk back. My text is in your packet, so you don't need to be looking at it now, and if you miss anything, you can catch up on it later. Um, but I'm going to begin with a quick year in review, lest it be said that we were only working on the campaign this year. In January, we had our second annual variety show and chili cook-off, <laughs> filling the parish hall with joy and laughter and good food, and God was glorified in our fellowship. Uh, if you look at the back of the room, you'll see a sign-up sheet where you can sign up for this year's annual variety show and chili cook-off, uh, which has just become one of the highlights of the year for me. In February of this year, Minister of Communication presented about our work in the area of communications at a church-wide conference in Denver, Colorado. It's worthy of note that several of our staff members are developing new resources and new curricula, new work that's being recognized by the wider church and that is finding itself in use in other places. This is what we call a resource parish by size and culture, and we're living into that by being resources for the wider church. In March, Dr. Walter Brueggemann came to lecture at Church of the Holy Communion 
almost inarguably the uh, most prominent Christian scholar of the Old Testament, still writing today, was here to offer a lecture. But we took our usual speaker series and twisted it just a bit, keeping him over another day and having a breakfast in this room for clergy in Memphis across racial and denominational lines to be in conversation with each other and with one of the world's great living theologians. One of the things I'm most proud, about, most proud of in that event is that it was co-sponsored by three leaders of African-American congregations in Memphis, uh, and it was co-sponsored by uh, some leaders of predominantly white congregations in Memphis that don't usually co-sponsor things. It was us and Second Presbyterian and Idlewild listed as the um, named co-sponsors, and we found a way to bring together people who have very different perspectives and sit down for a really rich conversation. Our speaker series this year will be on March 23rd of 2017, Dr. Omed Safi from uh, Duke University talking to us about the path of love in Islam uh, and also helping us with comparisons between Christianity and Islam and it promises to be a very rich conversation. In April, we hosted our Urban Pilgrimage in which we brought Dr. Kathy Grebe from Virginia Seminary, a noted New Testament scholar, to be with us, not just to lecture, but to help us create community with our friends at Emanuel Center. We hosted a dinner here with our friends from Emanuel Center. We hosted a work event down at Emanuel Center where we all rolled up our sleeves and got to work. And then we joined each other uh, for church that afternoon at St. Joseph's Chapel. It was a wonderful time to be together and to get to know some people that we might not otherwise have crossed paths with. The idea here is that outreach at Holy Communion is no longer ministry to but ministry with. It's about relationship as much as it is about work. In May, we had a baptismal day. This is actually an Easter picture, but it is a baptismal picture. I think that's Camille Stemmler uh, with me, if I'm not mistaken. In total, we had 13 baptisms last year, 28 confirmations and receptions, three weddings, and 19 funerals it can be hard to remember that we really do walk the whole road of life together at Holy Communion, and we do it well. In June, we sent out our 10th, count them, 10th youth pilgrimage overseas, this one going to Scotland with 22 teenagers and five adult leaders. Additionally, in April, 20 adult pilgrims went to the Holy Land to study at St. George's College. Yes, that is you, Cindy Stratton. In July, we started our annual health challenge, which led us to the Book It 5K in September. In total this year, we raised $23,680 for Emanuel Center and Shelby County Books from Birth. In August, our second core of Episcopal Service Corps leaders arrived in Memphis, three young adults committing themselves to a year living very modestly and in Christian community with one another and in the direct service of the urban poor. This is a partnership that we're in, uh, we've engaged with Grace St. Luke's uh, in order to get better connected with our uh, long-standing ministry partners here in the city. Uh, it is a project that has already borne fruit in seeing our relationship with MIFA and Bridges grow significantly uh, and Emanuel Center significantly last year. Uh, this is going to be our last year of Episcopal Service Corps, but it has been two years of wonderful success, and I'd like to recognize the work of Hester Mathis keeping on top of that and moving it forward. In September, we had our first parish retreat in several years, a great afternoon at St. Columba, uh, breaking in their new zip line and enjoying everyone's company, another time for Holy Communion, just to be away uh, and to enjoy each other's company. In October, the clergy and the pastoral care committee went to Kirby Pines and to Tresvent to have a social tea with our members who are there. We do this twice a year just to have community and fellowship with them, and there's room for anyone who would like to come and join us to be there as well. In November, we had Remembrance Weekend on the weekend following All Saints. The Military Order of the World Wars, which has been connected to Holy Communion for well over 30 years through Don Savage, our most recently uh, graduated uh, centenarian in the parish. He turned 100 on New Year's Eve. Uh, we have the annual Massing of the Colors through the Military Order of the World Wars, which is a wonderful community outreach program. 
and then our choir and orchestra and newly expanded children's choir mounted a full offering of Rudder's Requiem with funds from the Crump Music Endowment. And last but not least, another new program in December, the St. Nicholas Party for Children, which had a wonderful turnout and wonderful response and is another um, example of us doing new and creative things in this place. So lest we think that it was all about capital this year, this is what your contributions have gone to. This is what your staff has produced for you, and this is how we advance the kingdom in this place. Let's take a look, as we always do, at the statistics. By the numbers, Holy Communion had a great year. As David said, our pledge budget for 2017 is our largest ever at $1.62 million. This is up from $1.59 million in 2016, and up, more than a, um, up almost a half a million dollars from when you and I started together in 2013. And that's a record that I will hold up against any other church in the Episcopal Church. God is blessing us richly, richly in this place. The lion's share of our annual budget goes to support the compensation packages that are necessary for our staff. That includes their health care and their insurance and their stipend and all of the things that go along with that. We have 23 people who take their income in whole or in part from Church of the Holy Communion. It is the highest quality of staff that I could possibly imagine, and it is they who produce the product that we have. So when we give those gifts, we're underwriting that work. Average Sunday attendance this year uh, is also up from 401 last year to 407 this year, a growth of about 1.4%. Theologians would call our remarkable growth over the last several years as an example of God's economy. In 2013, we cast a vision for our future. We invested our resources strategically, and God has blessed us with greater resources to continue using. We, lo we loosened our hands just a bit, and God filled our hands more fully. This year's budget completes a four-year staffing plan that we established soon after I arrived. It continues our investment in communications and outreach, and makes new investments in children's music, an area of our ministry that doubled in size this year alone. The data do include a few cautionary tales, however. Had Christmas not fallen on a Sunday this year, mandating that we count Christmas and Christmas Eve as Sunday attendance, our average attendance actually would have flattened out just a little bit with a 1% decline. That's something we're going to keep our eye on and make sure that we're on top of. Also, as David reported, while our pledge revenues have increased, we're not expecting as much non-pledge revenue as we usually do. And on net, our expectations for parishioner gifts are about flat. Our remarkable success in the campaign for Holy Communion gives me incredible confidence that these numbers are going to correct themselves. This is the first year of capital campaign, uh, capital campaign payments. It's no surprise whatsoever, uh, but we're going to keep our eye on it in the year ahead. I am simply awestruck by the campaign for Holy Communion. In the last year, let us not forget, we have started and finished an architectural master planning effort that will give new life to all of our uh, ministry spaces. We have, negotiated a f and we have negotiated a financial and fundraising agreement with our neighbors at St. Mary's Episcopal School that is going to enable both institutions to reach new heights in the years ahead and we are well on track to completing the largest financial campaign in the church's history. Before I report on the status of the campaign, I'd like to extend two words of personal thanks. First, to St. Mary's Episcopal School and to Albert Throckmorton, my friend and collaborator and its head of school. In all of our research, we have identified no other case of two independent churches and schools raising money together for both shared and separate projects. We have charted new waters together this year, and nearly every aspect of our work has been characterized by a spirit of trust, openness, and collaboration. It is true to say that neither Holy Communion nor St. Mary's could have done their part without the other, and I'm very, very grateful to our friends. Second is to the people who stepped forward to lead the capital campaign. And what I'm going to ask just for a visual is for everybody who had a role to play in the campaign to please stand. Before you do, this will include the people who are on the leadership team, 
the people who had been volunteers making calls, the people who hosted parties in their homes or at the church, everybody who has had any part in the capital campaign, would you please stand? This simply could not have happened without an army of parishioners stepping forward to help. And in particular, I want to express my thanks to a new cohort of leaders who are stepping up. Some of the names that you've seen in leadership on this campaign are familiar, people who have been attending and leading in this congregation forever. Um, but some of the names are people who are just setting out to make their mark, people who are stepping up to receive the baton and to be our next generation of leaders. So many of my peers and colleagues around the church wish that they had that, a group of young leaders saying, this is my church, and I'm going to step up, and I'm going to make it my own. And I am so, so grateful, particularly to those who were stepping into leadership for the first time uh, or beginning to establish themselves in that role. As to the progress of our campaign, the Vestry established a $7 million goal that will provide for the renovation of all of our ministry spaces, for our portion of the shared work with St. Mary's, and for some deferred maintenance needs that we have truly deferred for too long. I am proud to announce that as of yesterday, uh, excuse me, as of close of business on Friday, we have raised $6.51 million, or 93.1% of our goal. I'm so grateful to CCS consultants who've been here with us, CCS Fundraising, and to Meg O'Halloran. Meg, give us a wave from the back. <laughs> Meg is our campaign director who's been in residence with us now since August. Um, and just yesterday, she said to me, or just this week, she said to me that for the first time, we think you're going to kick this thing. And I said, I bet you we are. <laughs> Here's what I'm going to say, though. This last 7%, 6.9%, depends on each and every one of us. The people who have the resources to give the large gifts probably have. And we have to cover this last gift, with this last gap, with ordinary folks doing what they can. Everybody's stretched for this campaign, absolutely everybody. For some people, those were very large numbers. For some people, they were smaller numbers, but we all stretched, and we're all in it together, and we are going to close that gap. If you have not yet had a chance to make your pledge, you will have one in the 1030 service, um, and we'll be following up with you as well. We're intending to wrap up the campaign in the next two weeks, uh, so this would be the time uh, if you haven't uh, made your commitment to do so. But wait, <laughs> there's more. The vestry had established its next capital priority as some renovation work in our nave. And it is a wonderful pleasure for me to announce this morning that a family in the congregation has stepped up to help get us going. In addition to the money that has already been raised for the campaign for Holy Communion, a family has offered a lead gift in the amount of $750,000 to get us going for the next phase. This is absolutely outstanding. It's something that we could never have hoped or dreamed for, and it's something that's going to enable us really to look at the future of our entire facility, not just pieces of it. In order to start using that 750000 for the nave, we need to close the gap on $7 million. And each of us has a role to play in that. And anyone who then wants to contribute to the uh, NAVE project certainly will. We're not going to be passing the hat again. We're not going to start a new campaign two days after we finish the old. But if you know of somebody who perhaps wasn't uh, used to be connected to this church and might want to make a legacy investment here, if you have access to a family foundation that can help us work on it, please let me know. We won't know about those things unless you tell us. Our number one question is, what happens next? When do we start? Here's what I can tell you. This spring, we're going to move through the design phase of all these buildings. What you see before you here, and if you haven't had a chance to review the numbers please, or the pictures, please come and look at them. What we have is a master plan. The master plan is lines and boxes on a piece of paper. It's not something that you can give to a contractor and have them build for you. So come uh, February through April, four things are going to be accomplished. First, a design contract will be issued to an architect. We have the architect who did the master plan coming to speak with the vestry on Tuesday. Um, we will form the necessary committees to oversee and guide this work. 
Um, oftentimes, when we're forming committees, we sort of brainstorm among the leadership. If you would like to be involved in a committee, please let me know. Um, we may or may not have space on whichever committee is interested, but if you want to serve, please, please let us know so that we can involve you in the process. We will get uh, feedback from you on the ministry spaces so that you, people can uh, say, I like this, I don't like that, try this, have you thought about that? And then our architects will get to work on designs that we can give to a contractor. That will all take place this spring, and we'll give you updates as we have them. But please know, we do have an architectural process that we have to go through before we can start swinging sledgehammers, tempting as that may be. Also, from April to May, we're going to do a little bit of work getting ready for the nave and thinking about what we want in that space. When we did the plan for the nave and tested it out in uh, focus groups, we got a lot of feedback. We got some folks who said, I really like it. We got some folks who said, I really don't. We got some folks who said, gosh, I'd do this and that, but probably not this or that. We are committed to doing this right and to listening well. And we're gonna do one thing at a time. So first, we're gonna move through the listening phase and listening process for the renovations of the space. Then on the three Sundays immediately following Easter, I'm going to give a class in this room on Sunday morning on liturgical design. Why is it that we design spaces the way that we do? What is the symbolism of the spaces that we have? And then after we've had that class and gotten our vocabulary up, we'll have listening sessions about nave renovation so that we can have an informed and theological conversation. And then we're going to recontract with the designer who did the initial plan uh, to help us um, carry that forward and incorporate everyone's feedback. Again, we will provide um, uh, signposts, smile markers to you as we go, but this is a general chart of what you can expect this spring. One final, one final comment. Nothing that we do is gonna please everybody. I'll just tell you that right now. But we're gonna work together. We're a church family. When there are opportunities to listen, please come. Please offer your feedback. Please send those emails and those comments so that we can incorporate them. Please volunteer to serve on committees so that we can get your voice involved. And then trust your, trust your colleagues. Trust your fellow parishioners because this is an opportunity that our church has never had before and won't have again for a very, very long time. And I could not be more excited. Thank you, everybody who made this possible. But what of the non-campaign things? As I said, in 2016, we were not only about a campaign, we were also about ministry. Um, and we need to do that again in 17. Here's what you can do for Holy Communion right now. You can attend and participate and give. We miss you when you're not here. We want for this to be the anchor of your week. We want you to hear the scripture and the songs and the proclamation. We want you here, and we notice when you're not. Please come. Also, your experience of the church will be deeper and richer, I assure you, when you enter into deeper relationship with the people who are around you. By participating in programs, in small groups, and coming to class, and hosting dinners, and participating in supper clubs, all of those things, we get to know one another, and we strengthen those bonds that hold us together as we go through the road of life. And then we give. This is our church. It's not going to be here without us. We are more than 93, 92, somewhere in that percent dependent on church uh, members' gifts. We don't have a massive endowment that underwrites our operations. For the first time, though, this year, in several years, the endowment is um, providing for uh, supplements to the operating budget. It's providing for uh, some new computer technology. It's providing for a safety and security assessment at the church. It's also going to provide for professional development for the lay staff. That's what we're going to use those resources for in the year ahead. Um, so we all participate by giving, um, and that's important as well. But Sandy, how is it that I could participate in a new way? That's a wonderful question, Emily. Thank you. I understand you're giving up a role, um, and you might need a, you might need a new job. <laughs> if you look in your packet, you will see a paper entitled Ministry Opportunities. This is but a smattering of the opportunities that are before us at Holy Communion. But if you take out that paper, let's actually take out that paper. We'll just practice here. If you take out the paper, it's on the right-hand side and it's called Ministry Opportunities. Looks like this. 
This is but a very, very few of the ministry opportunities that are available at Holy Communion, but these are ministry opportunities that are ready to receive you right now. No waiting. And what I'm going to ask you to do is if you are moved by this, and I hope that you are, sign your name at the bottom, put your phone number or your email, check one of the boxes, and I guarantee you, members of my staff, are you listening, I guarantee you that you will get a call within 36 hours about getting involved with one of these ministries. Please sign up. You can leave them on your chairs. You can leave them on the table. You can give them to Elizabeth. Elizabeth, would you give us a wave? Thank you. That's Elizabeth, and she's the ultimate um, the person who ultimately needs to get these, uh, but please do sign up and take on something new in the year ahead. One word of conclusion. It remains my incredibly great privilege to be your rector, just shy of three and a half years, if you can believe it. Our future together is brighter than we ever thought possible when we started out together, and I'm grateful to each and every one of you for that, and I am grateful to God for the opportunity to advance his kingdom on this street corner. Amen.